Hi, in this video I'm going to talk about a project where I built some sensors that transmit barometric pressure, temperature, and humidity. They're based on the BME 280 uh, together with a microcontroller and an RF transmitter. Uh, so the actual reason that I uh, decided to make these was these print dry containers. Uh, these are containers for 3D printing filament. They are vacuum sealed. So you push this. Well, actually this one doesn't have any vacuum in it at the moment because I didn't pump it up. Uh, but anyway, you open the container. It's got like a triple seal. Uh, roll of filament. And then in the middle here, I put uh, a container of desiccants. So there's a little blue uh, silica gel in there. And the idea, if you're unfamiliar with 3D printing, is that you want to keep your filament uh, dry. So the desiccant removes the humidity. Vacuum could also have an effect on humidity, but I think more importantly, vacuum sealing is going to ensure a good seal around that rubber seal. When I first bought these things, they weren't holding uh, pressure real well. So I wanted to put sensor in here so I could detect whether it still had its uh, vacuum. So I have an old airplane altimeter here. I um, actually flew with this altimeter for a while, but it is now beyond its service life, but will be useful for this experiment. Put it inside the case. We had a place where we can see it well enough. Okay, so the altimeter is currently reading about 450 feet, and I'm going to pump this 10 times and we'll see what happens. So we made it up to about, what, 3,500, but it's going to drop for a while. And my observations have been that it drops and then it reaches a steady state. And the steady state is usually will end up around like about 2,000 feet, so about 1,600 feet of pressure altitude. So uh, when we're talking vacuum, we're not talking a whole lot of vacuum. This is a difference in air pressure right now from starting out at uh, 400 feet of elevation and going up to 3250. So this is just like if you climbed a decent uh, hill around that was, you know, a couple thousand feet tall. Um, not a whole lot of vacuum, but I think the benefit of the vacuum isn't so much that um, it's a huge vacuum that's going to like boil water or something. It's not. It's just a vacuum that's going to pull in tightly on this seal, ensuring that, you know, your humid air doesn't leak past that seal. So your primary drying thing is still going to be your thing of desiccant. But anyway, as you can see, this... This thing does lose pressure over time. Um, depending on the containers I bought, they lose pressure anywhere from an hour to a day to a week to a month. There was huge variability. You can kind of uh, clean up the, the little rubber valve on the top and maybe it'll work uh, uh, better. Um, I managed to get all of mine in pretty good shape by cleaning up the valve, putting a little bit of Vaseline around the ceiling surface. Uh, but still, you know, I had this thought that there's containers sitting here. I don't know if, if they're still vacuum sealed or not. Um, I don't know what the humidity is inside of them and I don't know if my desiccant's all worn out and I'm storing my 3D printing filaments in it. So what I thought I'd do is I'd deploy some sensors that were small enough that I could get them inside the container and they would transmit the uh, barometric pressure to let me know if it's still sealed and they would transmit the humidity to let me know if the desiccant is still good. So I should mention the very first thing I did is I used some of these things you can buy on Amazon for about three bucks a piece. Um, these will tell you temperature and humidity. Um, so originally I put one of these in each container. The, the problem is they're either aligned at the bottom of the container or the top. You can't really read them when they're stacked up. You don't really look at them. Uh, so you've got no automatic reporting or tracking. It also doesn't do the pressure, but if you just wanted to do humidity, a lot of people do use these. Uh, the other problem with these things is they're not super reliable. I've had several of them just stop working. I've also had some of them apparently freeze and just display the wrong humidity uh, reading until it was power cycled. So let's try to do better than this thing. My first prototype is here. This is an electronic ink display connected to an Atmega AT328 with a BME 280 sensor. 
So it's actually not powered right now, but electronic ink, as anyone who's ever owned a Kindle knows, retains its last image even without power. So let's see if we can plug it in and see what happens. So this was my first prototype, but there were several reasons why this didn't work out so great. Um, first of all, uh, the displays are kind of expensive in hobbyist quantities um, with the breakout boards and everything else. Um, most expensive component here is that display. I forget what the price was, but it, it adds considerable expense to the project. Uh, the second problem I ran into, power consumption. So this breakout board from Waveshare that I'm using, I don't know if you can see the back on it, it's got level converters and stuff in here. And those level converters were drawing um, power even when we're not uh, operating the display, enough power that they would ruin my power budget, which is to originally power this off of uh, CR2032 batteries. So I was certainly going to have to re-engineer the breakout board to get rid of the level converters, which I didn't even need and didn't want, but they were still there. Uh, plus we've got the expensive display. Uh, the next problem with it is the, the refresh is kind of ugly. Um, you know, it has to go black and then white and then black. Well, you can see what it's doing here is it's refreshing itself. If your display can do partial update, and this one may actually be capable of doing that if I'd spend some time working on the code. Um, if your display can do partial update, then you can get rid of this annoying blanking stuff. I just didn't, uh, by, by, by then I knew I wasn't going to go with this solution. And then finally, it, it's kind of big. Uh, I did purchase a smaller display, one that would be 1.54 inches square and would kind of piggyback over the top of this board, but still it's, it's kind of big having the display. If, if I was a commercial manufacturer and I could make something that was entirely surface mounted, including this connector and any other electronics that are actually necessary on the breakout board, then I, I could probably get this down to a nice small thing. I mean, Kindles after all are pretty darn thin. Uh, but I'm not a commercial manufacturer, I'm a hobbyist, got hobbyist level skills, so trying to get this thing down into a small, tiny package that I can put inside those uh, 3D printer containers is not going to be easy. So I came up with what I think is a better idea, and what that is going to be is a wireless solution. So let's say over here we have the sensor. micro transmitter and an antenna and over here antenna receiver and a raspberry pi so we've got Receiver unit, transmitter unit, and a wireless signal between them. And then I can deploy many transmitters over here. Each with their own antenna. each going to the Raspberry Pi. So what this will let me do is build a small cost-effective transmitter that I can easily deploy one per filament canister and keep the uh, complicated display and rendering bits over here in the Raspberry Pi. So this here, um, we've got three parts to it. On the side here we have a BME 280, that's the Bosch temperature humidity uh, pressure sensor. In the middle we have an AT Tiny 85 uh, microcontroller. And then over here on this side we have a 315 megahertz transmitter module. And now you can buy these transmitters on Amazon or eBay real cheap. You can get them um, I think like a transmitter and a receiver, a pair of them for like a buck. You can get the BME 280 sensors for a buck or two. So you know we've got one, two, three dollars um, the microcontroller, maybe another buck, so you're up to four bucks. Um, 
a CR2032 battery, another buck. So you're up to about five bucks plus incidental components and the printed circuit boards. So let's say six, seven dollars each. So I think I've, I've hit a price goal pretty good on this. There's actually a few different transmitter modules you can get. There's a 433 and a 315 that are very popular. Uh, the 433 being much more popular than the 315 that I used. The problem with the 433 is it interfered with the um, motorized shades in my office. I use these Somfy uh, motorized shades and they are also on 433 megahertz. So as soon as I started building these things, these things would send out a packet at exactly the same time I was trying to run the shade. The shade wouldn't work. It's kind of annoying, so I switched to the 315 megahertz modules. Okay, let's take a look at some common sensors. Here on the left is the BME280. This one has temperature, humidity, and pressure. It is the one that I used in my project. Right next to it is a BMP280. Instead of the E, we've got the P. This one is pressure and temperature, but not humidity. Now this one I actually bought from an eBay seller advertising it as a BME280, but it was actually a BMP280. He was kind enough to refund me half of my purchase price. Uh, I could have probably uh, demanded a full refund from eBay, uh, but I figured maybe I'll find a use for these someplace. I can almost guarantee you that the eBay seller who sold me the wrong part is probably still selling the wrong part because these are worth more and uh, he can sell an inferior part for a higher price and maybe a lot of people don't bother to return them, I don't know. But be very careful that you do buy from a reputable seller. If you want the humidity function, you need the BME280, not the BMP280. Over here, this one is also a BME280, so it has the humidity. Uh, but this is the 5 volt breakout board. These seem to be becoming more and more popular. If you look at the back side, it's got all kinds of crap here. Level converters, voltage regulators. Uh, the problem with this is because of the level converters and voltage regulators, it has a much higher standby power. So completely unsuitable to use one of these um, in a project that's running off of a CR2032 battery because it's just going to waste electricity from it. Uh, this one actually had a picture uh, when I bought it from an eBay seller of the 3.3 volt version, but what I got was the 5 volt version. So again, um, make sure you're clear with your eBay seller that you do get what you expect you're getting because they will have the wrong picture of the item. And over here we have a BME680. Uh, this one has a gas sensor feature that can tell you your air quality. I actually use this in my indoor air quality monitor project. Um, it's great, but the gas sensor does have a heater and would make it completely unsuitable for running from a coin cell battery. Tens of milliamps to power the heater probably. Um, you can turn the heater off, so you could actually use this, but you're gonna pay a lot for that gas sensor feature if you're not actually going to be using it. Why not just go down here and get the BME 280 instead of the BME 680. Uh, but anyway, those are the four common um, Bosch sensors that you will encounter out in the wild on eBay and AliExpress and Amazon. So here are three different uh, transmitter modules that you might encounter. This first one is the FS1000A. These are very popular on eBay. Uh, this one here is the H34A. And this one here is the SYN115, the SYN115. I originally started out with the these FS1000As. You can get them both in 433 MHz and 315. So I started out with a pack of these from Amazon. Uh, I think it was six of them. Uh, but half of them, uh, three out of the six, were off frequency. And they were off frequency by as much as 200 kilohertz. Uh, now that being off frequency was enough to make it difficult to receive the signal and I got very poor range out of the ones that were off frequency. So the part numbers uh, on the good and the bad ones out of these that I received were different. The R315A, you can see that's this one. Uh, it was the R315As that I had trouble with with off frequency. Ones that were marked simply R315, uh, those ones were fine on frequency. Uh, so different batch of uh, resonators, perhaps. 
Uh, the other wonky thing with this is there's like three holes here, and it's unclear which one the antenna should be soldered to. I tried all three, really didn't get any better performance, so I don't know. Um, I think some people say it's this hole here that the antenna is supposed to go to. Um, if you get the 433 megahertz version, there's an additional coil that goes from there to there. Maybe that coil is simply not needed in the 315 megahertz version. Uh, the H34A I had big hope for, especially because it's such a tiny module. But I really got very poor uh, transmission distance out of this module, so I kind of gave up on it. And then I tried the, the SYN 115, and this one is perfect. This one worked out great. It's specifically a low voltage module, which is great for my application because I'm running off of uh, a 3 volt battery. Uh, and it also has a built in standby mode, so if you don't transmit, it'll automatically shut itself down. Um, and I, I checked, I think I bought 10 of these, I checked them all, and the frequencies, they were all like a perfect match for one another. So no weird wonky frequency stuff with this one. So this is the one I decided to go with. Okay, let's take a look at the schematic. Very, very simple. Um, we have the AT Tiny 85. I actually put two footprints in. I put the uh, one of these is this one here is the surface mount one. This is the through hole one, so I can make a board with either one. Uh, down here we have the header for the temperature sensor. Uh, the temperature sensor takes 3.3 uh, volts ground, and then uh, two I2C pins. The first one is SCL, and the other one is SDA. Uh, now for your I2C, you need some pull-ups, so I've got pull-ups. Then I also threw on these 100 ohm resistors. Uh, the reason I put those in there was these, uh, there's a limited pin count on the AT Tiny 85, and the pins you use for in-circuit programming are the same as the pins that we're using to talk to the uh, temperature, humidity, pressure sensor. Uh, so I was kind of worried that, you know, we could end up with some failure here where this was outputting a signal that contradicted what, what was going on in the programmer and and you know maybe something would get overloaded or the communication would get garbled while programming so I threw in those resistors as some protection um, and it works fine I am able to program on the programming header uh, while the temperature sensor is plugged in and, and the world doesn't explode everything continues to work uh, we've got some decoupling capacitors two different footprints for CR2032 batteries a header for me to uh, plug in bench power when I was doing uh, current measurements with it. So over here we have a header for the transmitter module. So when using an FS1000A, the first three pins are used, which is a uh, switched ground, a 3.3 volt and a transmit. When using the SYN115, the bottom three pins are used, which is the 3.3 volt, the transmit, and a ground. I did, uh, for the FS1000A, and similar modules, I put in a transistor here that I could turn it on and off uh, because I was thinking, you know, that maybe this thing is going to pull some current uh, just sitting there and I didn't want to drain the battery, so I figured I'd have an enable pin which would switch this transistor on, ground that module. Um, that seemed to be working fine, although there is a voltage drop in that transistor. We're already at low voltage, so it is a little bit unfortunate uh, to have that voltage drop. I made it so I could solder it across if I want to. But anyway, I decided not to use the FS1000A, so we use the simpler pinout down here. Bottom three pins for the SYN115. It has a built-in automatic shutoff, so we don't have to worry about switching it on and off. Um, it'll turn itself off when it's not needed. So here's a close-up of one of the PC boards. You can see I used a Surface Mount AT Tiny 85 I've got a little six-pin header over here. For programming, I don't actually have to populate the header. I use pogo pins, so I can just kind of shove the programmer on this and program it um, without actually having to solder that header on. I've got some resistors in here, some 100 ohm resistors for the I2C, and some like uh, 5.1K pull-ups. And we've got a capacitor here, a decoupling capacitor. Then on the flip side, there's a socket for a CR2032 battery. We've got a couple headers. 3-pin header over here is for the uh, the transmitter and over here this 6-pin uh, header which we only use 4 pins of is for the BME 280 sensor. You'll notice there's an extra hole right here that I drilled through there 
and corresponding on the back, a place that I scraped off the solder mask around. Um, that was to accommodate the SIN 115 module, which had a different pinout uh, than the original FS 1000As that I had designed this board for. Uh, so that's the board. So here is my final prototype. It's actually the same PC board as this bigger one, uh, but I've kind of folded the components in to make it a little bit tighter. I did switch transmitter modules. This is the SIN 115 versus this one here was an FS-1000A. We've still got over here the BME-280. And then underneath it all, we've got the um, AT-Tiny85 microcontroller. So certainly you, you kind of build this thing up from the bottom. You make the first boards, um, solder on the microcontroller, then you piggyback these two, and then it's done. On the back here, we still have our battery. So the desiccant containers that I put in um, inside of my 3D printer uh, filament canisters, uh, these des desiccant containers actually have a slot that was designed to hold this thing and I engineered it so that my module fits in that same space. And then I printed this little cap which goes on here and that holds the module in. Also provides a bit of a handle for lifting it up. Strain relief on the antenna wire. Uh, so there we have it. This little thing, I can deploy one of these inside of each uh, 3D printer uh, filament canister and it will give me my um, temperature, humidity, and barometric pressure. So here is my receiver system. I decided to go with a Raspberry Pi. This is a Raspberry Pi 4. And the first thing I tried was this receiver that came with the FS-1000A transmitters. Um, and this is it here. I wired it to the GPIO on the Pi. And I ran, a, I think, a library called RC Switch to read it. Um, I did not have good luck with this receiver. Um, I, the problem I had was I think it was hard to get this thing tuned properly. Uh, I don't know that it has a crystal on it anywhere. Yeah, so I don't see a crystal there anywhere. Uh, maybe I'm just not seeing it and there is. Or maybe it's just some kind of, you know, inductor-based resonator. I'm not sure. It does have this coil here for tuning. I tried fussing with the coil on some of them to try to, you know, try to fine-tune it to get better reception. But I just couldn't get reliable reception out of this. Maybe I get a couple feet. Um, I really wanted something that would give me reliable reception across the room. Now, I will say that um, the 433 megahertz modules, I did have better luck with the transmitter receiver pairs. This is one of the, the uh, 315 megahertz receivers, and it was the 315 in particular that I just had lousy luck with. So I started looking for alternatives, and what I came up with was RTL SDR, so that's Software Defined Radio. That's this dongle here plugged into the uh, Raspberry Pi. So. SDR, you can do all kinds of things with it. These, um, these devices were originally for receiving FM radio and television, but people repurpose them to receive uh, aviation signals, all, all kinds of stuff. And it can actually tune both 433 megahertz and 315 megahertz. And we've got a high quality crystal oscillator in it. It can be tuned from the Raspberry Pi. You can lock onto the signal. It actually has a nice antenna. Um, so this turned out to be a way better idea just to use this. I think these things are like 20, 30 bucks. I've actually had this one sitting around for a while. Um, so we don't need this receiver here at all. Uh, I ended up going exclusively with this and I used a software package called RTL underscore 433 and that is for decoding various uh, signals uh, using this dongle. People decode uh, weather stations, they decode garage door openers, remote control switches, all kinds of stuff. So I wrote a custom plugin to decode my signals uh, that I was sending from the temperature sensors um, into this and into the Raspberry Pi. Okay, it's time for the demo phase of this video. Uh, so what I've got here, I've got the Arduino tool up. I just wanted to look at the software quickly. Uh, this is what I wrote to run on the ATtiny85. Uh, let's see, what is there? There's something I wrote here that does averaging, so I can collect several samples and average them. 
a um, little bit higher up there's a config block this allows me to program different configurations into the uh, each sensor including I can program an ID an amount of time to sleep uh, because I need to put the CPU to sleep so it doesn't consume all of the available battery there's a setup phase we enable the my switch library then down here we uh, set up the BME 280 and then we're pretty much down here in a loop where we read the sensors, uh, we average them. Um, if a sensor has changed, then we uh, send out a data packet. Um, or if we have received a certain number of uh, packets that are all the same, then we also send out a data packet. So I think I have it set so it sets it sends one every uh, five minutes if there is no change. If there is a change, then it'll send them more, more uh, often than five minutes. And then finally, we power down the CPU for the sleep time. That's it. Pretty simple program. I'll put it up on GitHub if it's not already. So here is the receiver software. So it is using the RTL433 library, and what it does is it basically receives... Uh, the packets that shows up and approach them to a tool called Prometheus. So you can see each packet here has come in. Let's grab this one here. This one here was sensor ID 2. Um, it had a humidity of 17%, so there's kind of an implied decimal point there. Barometric pressure of 847 hectopascals or something. Uh, temperature of 22 degrees Celsius, another implied decimal point, a CRC that's used to verify the packet is correct, a timestamp, its identifier, which this was sensor number two, um, and a sequence number. The sequence numbers are there so I can detect lost radio transmissions. So all this is doing is it's receiving these things from the RTL SDR dongle, posting them to Prometheus and Grafana. Now, Prometheus is running, uh, this is actually Grafana here. It, it's running in uh, this window in the browser. Uh, this is actually a service for monitoring uh, all kinds of things, uh, monitoring servers and data centers and such. So it's set up to do lots of stuff, like I can monitor my 3D printer. Uh, let's see, last um, seven days. You know, there's filament usage on my 3D printer, electricity usage on my printer. I've kind of gone through this before. I've got environmental monitoring sensors, um, all kinds of stuff. But the new page I designed is this uh, BME sensor page. This is showing all kinds of things about our sensors. So here is the inventory of sensors that I have. I have, what is this? This is uh, seven, eight, nine of them that I've built so far, um, deployed in various places. So you can see here is the time that we collected from them, as well as the humidity, barometric pressure, temperature, and sequence number. So we can take a look at sensor number six. This is one that is uh, deployed in, uh, in one of the uh, print dry containers. So I want to find something interesting. Let's do the last 24 hours. So a few interesting things. At this point here, up here, uh, what is this, 983 um, on the barometric pressure, the container was open, and then I closed it and pumped it down. So when we pumped down, we got this surge down here quite low, and then it slowly leaked some air back in. Uh, and then you can kind of see the air leaking in, the barometric pressure going up. At the same time, you can see sensor 6, his humidity when he was open to the uh, air in my office was around 57, 57%. When we closed the container and pumped it down, it dropped pretty darn quickly. Down here, I don't know what's up with that little spike. It's kind of weird. But you can see the uh, humidity dropped, and it's been pretty level down here at about 15%. Uh, let's see if there's any other sensors. Let's look at, can I see anything on one of these uh, sensors? Let's go out. Uh, yeah, so this here, this sensor um, 21, this is not a print dry container. This is just a normal old um, plastic box with a better than average seal on it. So it does not 
Um, it does not have any vacuum, so you can see we're kind of hovering around the 982 to uh, 986 on the barometer. This is probably just barometric pressure fluctuation in the atmosphere. But you can see the humidity um, drop down just in a normal plastic box. We got down to 12%, so that's pretty good. So we can actually compare two of them. Compare 21 to 6 that we were looking at. Uh, let me turn on 21 and 6 over here. Yeah, so you can see certainly 21, again, he was not vacuum sealed, so he's flat. But number 6, that's what we just looked at before. You can see where I closed him up and pumped the air out. Um, so an, an interesting takeaway would be on this that um, the vacuum sealed fancy $20 container and the like $7 not vacuum sealed container, they're both uh, achieving similar levels of uh, humidity. Um, the cheap container is actually outperforming the fancy vacuum sealed one, uh, but I think I may have more desiccant in the uh, cheap container. So what I will do is I'm going to let this thing run for a few months. Um, you know, during that period, maybe some of these containers may remain sealed. Uh, we'll see. And I will I will evaluate how well these print dry containers worked out. Um, but the basic takeaway from this, I can look over here at all of my sensors and I can see which ones have high humidity um, that I might need to replace desiccant. And I can see which ones uh, we've lost barometric pressure on um, that I'll know I need to vacuum back out. So I think this project is working well. My plan is to deploy a good 20 or so of these sensors. And I'll update the blog uh, once, I've, once I've got all those sensors running and collected some data from them. And we will see what happens. Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sand rail stuff. Bye.